meeting of the West Sacramento City Council Redevelopment Agency and Financing Authority. We're going to begin tonight as we do each week with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to invite our guests to join the council and staff in the pledge, which tonight will be led by, welcome back, Mr. led by Mr. Uh, William Lowell. The council did not meet in closed session, so we're going to proceed directly to our general administration agenda, item 1A, which is presentations by the public on matters not on the agenda but within the jurisdiction of the city council. This is noted on our agenda. Uh, the council is prohibited under state law from taking up issues that are brought up under item 1A, but it does represent an important opportunity for public forum. We do ask that anyone wishing to address the council on this or any other item this evening to please fill out one of the yellow cards that are available at the door and turn it into the city clerk. In front of the clerk is a timer that we use to ensure that everyone has a chance to be heard. And to that end, we ask that all comments be limited to no more than three minutes. Also in front of the clerk is a flip chart that indicates uh, the agenda item that we are currently on. Uh, <coughs> we also take the cards up to the conclusion of the staff report. Uh, once the testi public testimony and council questions and discussion have begun, we don't take any additional speaker cards. So if you're intending to speak on an item this evening, please turn the card in as quickly as possible. Um, before we get to item one, let me ask, is there anyone in the room that's here to speak on item 11, the wireless policy? All right, then uh, we'll uh, note that the uh, um, city manager has requested that we continue that item to the November 3rd meeting uh, uh, because uh, an incorrect version of the proposed policy was in the staff report in order to assure that members of the public and other stakeholders have the full opportunity to review the proposed policy before we take it up. Uh, it's being deferred to November 3rd without objection. All right, so we do have one request to speak under item 1A, and that is by Buck Rogers. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members, Buck Rogers. I live uh, in the, on the South River Road where uh, we're gonna be having a levy project here soon, and uh, Mr. Christoph has probably uh, kept you all up to date on what's going on down there. I'd like to offer you, uh, you know, one at a time, a, uh, a little private tour down there and show you some of the homes that may be taken out if, uh, if any of you'd like to do that. I'm available anytime, and I'm sure you know how to get a hold of me. So I've been there uh, over 60 years. I'll just let it uh, remain there. Anyhow, I have another, uh, I have a little question. Uh, about the flood control meeting that uh, we went to last Thursday. Uh, Katie Yancey said that the city was gonna be hiring a uh, consultant to uh, see about relocating some cell towers. <clears throat> one, one cell tower is on Linden Road and two of them are on uh, my mom's uh, property. And I was just wondering whose idea and what, what is the reason behind uh, relocating those towers? Maybe you can find out and get back to me. I'd be, be glad to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. All right, that's our only request. Do you have any in, 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 instant uh, information on that, Mr. Rush, or should you get? I, I think Mr. I could Rogers? probably clarify. It's the same same issue of uh, examining whether, if they had to be relocated, what would the cost and the difficulty be in in, re, in uh, relationship to the levy. All right, then uh, we'll proceed to item 1B, which is council communications. Are there any reports or other communications this evening? Mr. Johannesson. Yeah, just quickly, the West Sacramento um, Housing Development Corporation met on September 22nd, and uh, outside of just a routine update on the, the, the um, different properties, um, one of the main updates was a resolution of a lawsuit that the, um, that, uh, the, the um, corporation had against uh, one of the uh, contractors on one of its properties, and that law lawsuit has been resolved. Um, and the other is a, um, an increased uh, relationship with Yolo Wayfarers, um, which um, you may know um, uh, runs a, a homeless shelter in, uh, in Woodland, and in assisting in finding uh, people to, um, that are actually from West Sacramento to um, help them um, get housing in um, West Sacramento. So those are the two items. All right, Mr. Ledesma. Thank you. I have a couple of reports tonight. First of all, um, from the uh, city school two by two meeting. We had a meeting on October 4th 
um, here in, uh, at City Hall. And in attendance was myself, along with board members Mary Leland and Adam Menke. And we had a couple of things of interest. Uh, first of all was a presentation we had by a group of uh, nonprofits in our city uh, who are coming together in a partnership for better, their goal is to have better communication and coordination of uh, nonprofit activities, events, and, and communication to uh, city residents so they can find, um, um, from what I gather, um, a, a, a better uh, a place to, where all of them coordinate events, coordinate news, um, and then they have access to some city services. So they have came to both the board and the city to explain their um, their their objectives, and uh, it was really a, a good presentation. Um, the city is going to start looking into some of that. Um, Toby had agreed to uh, assist them and help to set that up. So um, it seemed to be a good uh, endeavor for both the board and the uh, council or the city and the, and the school district to get involved with to help support that initiative for better community uh, participation. Also, there was um, a, um, a very good uh, development in regards to uh, facility enhancement. Um, the uh, 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 school superintendent brought to, uh, to the uh, two by two, a proposal for, at least a starting proposal to look at the opening of the, uh, the, the high school track, uh, something that we thought may not have um, went away. He, they went ahead and did some more work and are looking now into furthering um, uh, an endeavor between the city and the school district to open the track to uh, public hours. Um, they'll still be working through, I think, with our city staff on the work hours and the exact um, what the proposal might be and then take it back to the school board uh, to see if they can let um, allow that uh, sort of use to continue or at least to start. Um, so it was a good development. I'm glad they were taking a proactive uh, attempt to try to get this one piece of uh, cooperative uh, uh, facility um, use uh, together. So it was a very good development. So that was pretty much it for the school two by two. And then this past Monday, I attended the uh, Yolo Natural Heritage uh, program JPA board um, some some general business there but they're they're going to there's going to be uh, some outreach in the next 30 to 60 days uh, start uh, laying out the uh, implementation plan uh, for the uh, JPA's uh, work plan for the for the uh, heritage program that is the conservation program that they're endeavoring so there will be I think on November 7th or, or 12th I, I don't have it in front of me I think they will be here uh, doing some outreach on the program um, and so uh, and I would invite the public to pay attention. If they're interested in that, understand what the work plan is um, uh, for that program. So that's basically all I have. Pro Tem Christoph. Uh, two, two issues. Uh, one, the uh, uh, Sacramento Yolo Port District um, uh, met uh, the, uh, earlier today, and the main item w on the agenda was a, a contract award for dock strengthening. Uh, and the reason that it is necessary and needed is because there's a new crane that is coming in that is going to uh, um, assist the port uh, with uh, uh, an agreement between Stockton, uh, Sacramento, and um, Oakland uh, as far as uh, the movement of goods. And so we, they needed another crane. The crane's coming in, and the crane is a big one, and so the dock needs to be strengthened. and and fix so that it passes all certifications and everything. And the West Sacramento Flood Protection uh, JPA met, as Buck had said, to, um, last week. And um, there were a couple things I think that is of interest uh, to the council especially, and that is the SAC Bank project is uh, going to um, come to a conclusion. Uh, it's going to be buttoned up and closed up. It's not finished, but it's going to be buttoned up, closed up, and uh, that is the area between the Sacramento River and the port. Uh, there's an area in there, and we've all seen the things going on at Linden Road. They've closed Linden Road so they can do some work and that sort of thing. Well, they're not going to finish that project this year, and it should be finished next year. Um, so they do need to uh, close it up by, I think it's November 1st, um, but uh, anyway, uh, that needs to be done. And also, the, the really big issue here, and of course for 
some time to come, and that is going to be um, the decision on on uh, what uh, uh, different uh, proposals are, are proposed for fixing a levy, especially a levy south of um, Linden Road. And uh, there's uh, certainly it's, it's controversial. Um, certainly, um, uh, there are, I believe, three, maybe four alternatives now. And um, we're trying to get up front. We're trying to get ahead of the whole issue, um, keeping everybody as informed as we possibly can. And in doing all that, one of the um, one of the position papers that uh, we've uh, put forth, and that is uh, a real estate acquisition guideline, because there may be, I'm not saying there is, but there may be uh, the necessity to acquire some property so we can do the proper level, I mean, uh, 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 flood fixes. And uh, we have that available. We passed them out at the meeting, and I believe staff said they're going to pass those out to all of the people in the affected area. And if anybody needs one or anything, please get a hold of RD 900 at Ken Rusich's office, and we'll make sure we uh, get as much information out to you as we possibly, as soon as we possibly can. And I know our even our city staff with Mike Bassett and Bill Panos, and, uh, those folks, they're certainly trying to uh, keep everybody up to date. If anybody has any questions, they've opened um, their schedules so that they can uh, make sure they meet with people and uh, we can try to stay in front and ahead of this issue. Uh, those are uh, the two committees that I have to report on today. All right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Christoph. Uh, just on SACOG, uh, the Transportation Committee met earlier this month, but our full board meeting is on Thursday. Uh, in terms of ministerial actions, we've got um, allocations to us for um, uh, transit, the, both the state transit dollars of, uh, I want to say, $265,000, and then our, our share of the Transportation Development Act sales tax revenues as well to support transit claims in the city is on the agenda. Uh, we're also continuing work on what I reported on at the end of last month to the council, which was the um, uh, big, gigantic fail at the last SACOG board meeting. Um, around trying to adopt uh, the land use map that undergirds the proposed metropolitan transportation plan and our inability to reach agreement on the, re on the regional scale and the, and the um, uh, deadlock between the cities and the counties or the flatlands and the foothills or whatever, however you want to slice it, um, and the severe consequences that that could potentially have for us and uh, Isleton and Sacramento in particular, those jurisdictions that are in the, in the Delta, and then the potential um, impact, impacts for the whole region if there happens to be uh, stimulus or Jobs Act or some other federal initiative that puts money out on the street right at a moment when we might potentially be out of air quality conformity because we don't have a, an approved MTP that the consequences could be enormous. So we've been trying to avoid that. I think I reported at the last meeting that the board did agree to stay on track and we're doing our best to, to accomplish that in a lot of ongoing negotiations between the SACOG staff and uh, the building industry, but it remains, uh, this is, we're, we'll be on the edge of our seats on Thursday to see where we sit with this. Uh, the Sacramento County um, suburban development projects remain a significant challenge. Um, the, I think the County of Sacramento would like us to have an MTP land use map that um, is you know, something like 600% of what actual capacity to population growth and we just can't do that under the federal under the federal regulations um, so we're still working those working through those issues but I think we're hopeful um, that we'll be able to continue to, we'll get the MTP done not on the schedule that we had originally hoped but on the one that we've been working on for the last year which would have it completed in uh, April of this coming year so more, more to come but we'll have a more complete report after the board meeting on Thursday all right, we have no appointments this evening, so that brings us to the consent agenda, items two through seven. Are there any items on consent for removal or any item for a separate question or comment? All right, <laughs> item, oh, and I've got three. Item two is consideration of proposed refinancing of the 1997 lease revenue bond. Mr. Johannesson. Hi, Paul. Um, the only question here is um, I'm looking at, uh, so basically what we're doing is we're refinancing 
1997 lease bonds, the net present value of the savings over 19 years is 495000 There's going to be costs associated with lawyer fees, and what do you estimate that's going to be? Well, the, uh, for one thing, the, uh, the, uh, the costs of the refinancing are factored into that rate, and so the savings that you see is net of those uh, costs. 495 is net of that? And we estimate the uh, the cost of issuance would be about a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, yeah, that was the only question. I, I didn't know whether the four ninety five was net or not. So that's it. Thanks, Paul. On on this one, the the term is you've already determined the term. I, it's we've got two of these refinancing items up tonight. Yep. It's the other one that you've left open in the staff report. You might be interested in extending. It's that, not this one. That's right? correct, Mayor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, item three is consideration of the terms of agreement between the city and the West Sacramento Police Officers Association. I don't have a question about it, Phil. I just want to um, note the significance of what is being done tonight. Uh, you know, we have heard um, loud and clear, and I know folks throughout the country and California have as well, about the need to um, uh, um, reform the way that we handle retirement systems and, and to um, uh, deal with the long-term cost implications. And this contract that we're voting on tonight uh, with the Police Officers Association recognizes that, and I, I want to acknowledge the, um, the, uh, uh, the spirit in which the members of the Police Officers Association have, have been participating in that work, and this is a, uh, this, the terms of this agreement reflect the priorities that we've heard in the community, that, uh, that employees ought to pay a share of their, a portion of their own retirement, um, uh, that, that uh, 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 and, th and that we have reasonable limits that, that reduce the long-term costs, but also maintain, keep faith with the employees that do do so much in our community and mean so much to the work that we're trying to accomplish. And so I just want to, for the, you know, for the, you know, this is on consent and there's been extensive negotiations around it, but to note for the, the record the, uh, the, co the collaboration and the cooperation that we've, uh, we've experienced with the Police Officers Association and coming to, the, to, to terms on what are pr some pretty significant reforms in the way that, that uh, retirement is handled in our community. All right, item four is approval of renaming Pennsylvania Park, located at the intersection of 17th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue. Mr. Johannesson. Uh, thank you. Hi, Bob. Good evening. All right, on this, um, <clears throat> there's, there's really just one issue. Um, when we start looking at naming uh, public facilities, I mean, I've, I've gone through the, the um, resume and the information. It's, it's not of uh, the person, but it's more the process and how far along we are on this. And one of the things that was kind of um, omitted from this report was um, any reference to um, consultation or, or at least running this by the Historical Society, who I think right now is pretty much the keeper of history in West Sacramento. And when we start naming things after people, we probably should have a formal process where you have some, at least in a report, that this has been run by the Historical Society. And Commissioner Jerry Wingfield is also on the, um, she's affiliated with the Historical Society, also on the Parks Commission. Um, there was a conversation with her regarding this, and as far as, we, were, we felt comfortable with her response that um, this seemed to be legitimate. We left it at that. We didn't take it before the Historical Society per se. We're happy to do that if council feels that that's necessary. But um, after looking at all the documents and having Jerry's input, we felt pretty comfortable that it looked pretty legitimate, so we left it at that. But again, we're happy to take it um, back to the Historical Society for review if, if that's what the council wishes. Well, now, are you working on a policy now for this type of thing, or is it, what is the policy on? Well, we, we don't get many of these, but we do, we, we occasionally get, <clears throat> you know, requests to put a, a memorial in a park or put a bench up someplace, and this is pretty much the process. Um, we did go back and make sure that this particular park um, that there was no significance in the name of Pennsylvania Park. We went back as far as we could go, could find nothing in the records that, um, that there was any action taken by any, by any, uh, any council previous to that. Um, again, we also posted the park. I think we had, we had notices posted in the park for about three weeks prior to the second um, Parks Commission meeting. We heard no responses. Again, we felt pretty confident in moving forward. Again, we don't get many of these. Had, had this been a fairly new park and someone was requesting a rename and we had gone back and looked at it, had gone through the commission and the council adopted the name, we probably would have denied that, but we couldn't find that in this particular case. So 
again, it seemed reasonable to bring it forward. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see just to make sure that, um, you know, it's not a member on the historical society that is presumed to convey the information back to the group. But, sure. you know, there's it's some process where you at least run that by because sure. I know. Happy to do it. I know there's a list of events that they've been chronicling for, for quite a while. And okay. uh, there's a lot of history in West Sacramento and a lot of, you know, these opportunities may well come up from now from now and again. Sure. So, all we're, right. happy, we're happy to do that. Oh, and we have a historic preservation commission as well that has charged with this. So, right. I, when these issues come up, I mean, there's, there's, to me, there's sort of two, a couple issues around this, and I support the recommendation, but um, I also don't want to see us you know, constantly renaming parks. It's not, it's sure. not a trivial thing, and. I and see you did, you did your due diligence to find out what, hmm, what could have caused it to be caused Pennsylvania Park. Let's do some extensive research, and then you came to the conclusion that it's because it's on Pennsylvania Street. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. That's great detective, could do. great detective work. Um, but there's so there's there's the sort of the accuracy of the historical claim that's made in the in the application to support the standard that we have, and so. Uh, and, and that's an area where I think, you know, some check in with the historic, the, the decision is still the cities and the commissions and yours and the, both commissions and ours ultimately, but that check in is valuable in validating that. In this particular case, um, the applicant provided so much um, documentary evidence that I think it was pretty clear looking at it that, that, there, that, was, re that it was real, but sometimes you'll just get essays or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the level of significance test, right? So the, if we're going to change a park that community members are used to and they call it by that and they grew up calling it that and it mean, you know, has a place in their heart too that we're not just changing it for, for anything. It needs to be somebody who's made a truly significant um, distinctive contribution. And, but the third is a basic background check. Right? So we, we may know that an individual was, uh, was making tremendous contributions to the community for 25 years and then in year 26 they, you know, got, they went crazy and shot up a park or something and we, don't, we, we need to know that as well. And that's not the sort that may not be the sort of information that's provided, and so we need. The, um, I, I'm assuming that, that that some level of you know care has been done to you know do some sort of criminal check or something to assure that what we're, we're. I don't want to have accidentally named a park after a rapist because we didn't ask the question. Sure. Um, we need to be uh, so without you know without you know hiring a private detective. We should be, we should have some baseline standards okay. to be able to assure that. In addition to the positive contributions that we've assured that we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not bringing a blemish potentially on the city's reputation and the record and, and the neighborhood in which that park is located. So, okay. Anything else? On item four, the rest of the consent agenda. All right. That's it on consent. Is there a motion? It's been moved by Mr. Johannesson I'll and second. seconded by Mr. Ledesma. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. That motion carries. Item eight is a public hearing in consideration of resolution 11-72, which is an abandonment of public right of way along the west side of 6th Street, north of East Street. Good evening. Um, the item before you is a public hearing um, related to a resolution of vacation for a portion of 6th Street, north of East Street. Um, this item came to us when um, staff uh, found out that a portion of a, uh, the footprint of a building and a portion of a porch, essentially, uh, had been constructed within the right-of-way. Um, by abandoning a small portion of 6th Street, north of East Street, we would still maintain the city standard minimum of a 26 foot half width street on the, the west side here. Um, all of the prerequisite postings and public notifications have been completed. Um, there do not appear to be any utilities within the, the right of way to be abandoned and therefore a public utility easement is not recommended. Um, and staff is available for any questions. Are there any questions for staff this time? All right, seeing none, we're going to open the public hearing on item eight. We don't have any requests to speak because it is a formal public hearing. Does anyone wish to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. We'll return to the council for any additional questions or comments. I just have Christoph. One. What normally happens in these cases where someone builds into the right of way? I mean, I, I know that there's been some issues out in Southport where they've built into the right of way and, you know, you tear it down uh, or whatever else. So what's, 
What's different about this one than some of the other issues well, that we've had? The differences that uh, we've come across in this case are, um, well, one, the fact that this area is so old. It predates um, city incorporation. And so city, the staff as, as we know it, had, had no indication that this was even the case um, until it was brought to our attention. Um, secondly, based on our own current city standard specifications, the current width of that right of way is so large that even if we reduce it down to um, our own standard specifications, mm -hmm. we can eliminate that problem and not have to go through the process of making them tear it down or okay. making them tear down a piece of it. That's and good. we still maintain all of our current specifications. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Further questions or discussion? Is there a motion on item eight? Mr. Mayor, I'd recommend that the council conduct the public hearing, which we have done, adopt resolution 1172, vacating the most westerly 12 feet of 6th Street, beginning at the intersection of 6th and E Streets and extending north for a, dis for a distance of approximately 160 feet. I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, hearing none, motion carries. The motion is carries. Oh, and let me note uh, for the public that uh, Councilmember Viegas is out of the region on a work assignment, and that's why he's not here this evening, but he will be back at our next meeting. All right, that brings us to item nine, uh, and I'm get, we're gonna take item 13 out of order after item nine, after the public hearing on item nine, so that our um, guests uh, can depart. But item nine is public hearing and consideration of resolution 11-37, adopting the 2010 Urban Water Management Plan in consideration of second reading and adoption of ordinance 11-11, .11, enacting article 12 of chapter 13.04 of the city municipal code entitled Water Efficient Landscaping. Vince? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, the Urban Water Management Plan is a document the city is required to update every five years in order to comply with state law. Um, by extension, the, the Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance is an integral uh, conservation comp component of this plan. Um, adoption and periodic update of these documents is, is intended to promote water, efficient, uh, water efficiency. Um, on September 7th, uh, staff presented an informal workshop on draft versions of these documents um, seeking council guidance. And then staff returned on the 21st of September for the first reading of, of the Water, Fish, and Landscape Ordinance. And as directed by council, uh, staff also met with the Chamber of Commerce to present the main points of the, of the ordinance. And here we are tonight to ask council to consider adoption to, of, of these documents. All right, any <coughs> questions of staff at this time? All right, so now we're gonna open the public hearing on item nine. Again, we have no request to speak, but it's a formal public hearing. Does anyone wish to address the council on item nine? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing, return to the council. Any further questions or discussion? Motion, Mr. Ledesma. Thank you, I will uh, move the recommended action. It's been moved by Mr. Ledesma and seconded by Mr. Johannesson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries. Uh, so we're, without objection, we're going to uh, move to item 13, which is information on the Sacramento River, River Crossings Project. And since the Sacramento City Council was gracious enough to let me go before the Occupy Sacramento agenda item last <laughs> night, we're, gonna, we're taking these, <laughs> these folks out, out, out of order, too. <laughs> Your, your lights off at I mean, least. It's not, there we go. I did want to inform you about the, the definition of a neighborhood friendly bridge um, that was um, presented to the Sacramento City Council last night and to let you know that they did give their unanimous approval to the report and did direct staff to um, continue on with next steps. So you have the, um, the definition in your staff report. I can answer any questions about what happened last night or what's happened in the last couple months or about that definition if you'd like. No, but I, 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 do have a question. I do have a question, uh, and that is, I, 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 as I look through this, I see where we're going to study four different alternatives, and, or maybe. And anyway, one thing led to another, and 
what would be the price if we just concentrated on one river crossing? Let's say from 15th Street to uh, uh, to Broadway. Um, well, we did work up a sort of incremental cost. It's roughly fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars per bridge, but I think the greater cost is to regional circulation. Um, the, the conclusion of the study, what we presented to you in July, was that we need two bridges, that there is not a single location that can serve the separate market area as well and actually achieve what we're setting out to do a bridge for, and that's why we recommended at least uh, two locations. Because from, from my perspective, I think what we ought to do is just focus on one or two of the locations mm -hmm. and then get that task done. Yeah. See if we can put the, the kind of bridge that is going to be acceptable to both sides and the kind of bridge that uh, really does what a bridge does in a very efficient manner. And so, you know, I mean, it, it's, it just seems like we're, we're going through a, an effort in futility to study all these other things and then we'll, maybe we'll narrow it down. Actually, the process that you're describing is exactly what we have to do okay. if we're going to be qualified for any kind of federal or state funding. Because both CEQA and NEPA, um, through the environmental process, require that we um, examine a number of alternatives. We can't just pick one now and, you know, and plow ahead with that. We have to look at um, alternative, okay. at a minimum of three ways to, to solve the issues that we identified. All right, yeah. thank you. So I would, uh, I know there was at least one council member that agreed with you last night at Sacramento about narrowing it down to one, but a, a different one. And a so, different so one in addition sure. to the CEQA NEPA issues, I think the, uh, uh, you know, the fact is we've got, a, this is a partnership. We, I, I happen to think personally, we're gonna get to a point where we're not treating this as a, as a you know, as, a, as you know, so who's gonna accept a bridge where, but it's gonna, we're gonna be having to tell neighborhoods, no, we can't do your bridge yet because we're doing this, we're, we can only do so many bridges at a time that we're the, the, the neighborhoods are gonna be clamoring for them, designed properly, leading to things that they want, that folks wanna go to. Um, and so, and we, and Maureen's right, we need both of them. And given the regional land use strategy around the blueprint, the region's economic future, um, we need a muscular urban core. We need a muscular waterfront where we, wh river, di river area where we, we, where we say that this is the level of investment this region and the state have to make in the waterfront corridor and one bridge doesn't cut it. They don't, they, they're not good um, substitutes for one another given the different kinds of activity that's occurring. So I think we need, we need both. We need to make it very clear to the region, both of these are required. It isn't as though we have, somebody said here is a uh, $100 million gift certificate to use on the bridge of your choice. We don't have the funding for either one of them or for any of the three uh, or four options. Um, and so we don't even know that they necessarily can compete with one another for funding. I think at this stage, we need to, we need to put the study and the rest of the work that necessary to make the strongest case possible for both or more, but at least the both bridges that, that we know already are, are definitely needed. So I, I'm, I think the, the, both the, the, the sort of environmental, fiscal, and um, uh, di diplomatic work that's been done to, make, to bring this item forward, it does make sense. Even though f I think for us it's very clear that the South Market needs to get served ASAP, and for some folks on the Sacramento City Council, it's very clear the North Market needs, needs to get served ASAP, and we're both right. So, uh, I just I just wanted to make a quick comment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that I, I want to thank uh, the, the Sacramento City Council for pursuing this and, and unanimously unanimously um, moving forward on it because it. Agree with everything the mayor said about this needs to move forward for all the reasons. I did want to articulate one point in the staff report because I got asked about it a couple of times since um, uh, this went back to the city uh, to the city councils, both respective city councils, which was um, both city councils have agreed to remove the London uh, Sutterville potential crossing from the plan. Sure. So it's it's in the staff report. We didn't talk about that tonight, but both of us have agreed to do that, and so it is not part of the scope of any future options, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Can we do, uh, do you have a question? Yes, Mr. Mr. Johansson? Yeah, I just, I'd just like to comment that I, I had the opportunity to attend a couple of the early visioning sessions of this process, and, and looking at the recommendations now, it really holds true to the, the comments that were at that time, to have a bridge that's aesthetically pleasing, to not have it um, focus on cars, but a multimodal type bridge. Um, and having something that it would make a, a statement in the region. So 
um, I'd like to also commend staff to, to, to stick with this and, and we're gonna do our part to make sure these, uh, this project moves forward. Great, we do have one request to speak on the item. That's by Walt Superintendent representing, well, I didn't representing anyone, but Walt is a regional institution particularly known for his work with the uh, Sacramento Area Bicycle Advocates. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm here to talk about um, the neighborhood friendly definition and last night at the council, it was brought up that perhaps the definition could include a couple other criteria, namely the height of the bridge and the bulk or mass of the bridge and the approaches. And it was a little unclear about the council's action. Mr. Fong made the motion. I thought he included in the motion a friendly amendment to include consideration of the, of the height of the bridge. Um, but I'm sure you always take actions that are crystal clear. City Council's, Sacramento City's Council was not necessarily crystal clear. But it's an important issue for bicyclists and pedestrians because if there's a fixed bridge, it has to be at least 55 feet above the water level. So that means the equivalent of climbing five or six stories if you're a pedestrian and then descending five or six stories. Um, <clears throat> my colleague at Walk Sacramento uh, came up with the idea of Paris, not Pioneer. The bridges should be low, convenient, and not like the Pioneer Bridge, far above the water, difficult to use for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, in Paris, traffic on the River Seine is built to accommodate the bridges, not the other way around. And I know there's federal law about navigable waterways and I testified years ago, some of you were here I think, uh, when we did the Riverfront Master Plan about getting an exemption to federal law, changing federal law, so that we can have bridges that are low, much cheaper to build than a movable bridge or a bridge that's 60 feet high. Um, so that's my main point. Uh, two other issues I wanted to mention though. Um, I was a member of the Stakeholder Advisory Committee the uh, committee did not take Sutterville Road off the, agent, off the table. That was done by the city council at the behest of mostly land park neighbors. Um, but nobody ever objected to a bicycle pedestrian bridge at Sutterville Road. So that's still a possibility. <laughs> Another location that was never on the table, which I never really understood, was a bridge from Natomas to West Sacramento. So. All our considerations were south of the American River confluence. Um, it seems to me there's still a need for a bridge north of that confluence as well. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Walt. Mr. Johannesson? Yeah, just maybe a follow-up. Uh, Maureen, um, I know there was a discussion early on um, on the whether or not there's a decertification of the Sacramento River was even possible. What's the status on that? Um, it would literally take an act of Congress to um, um, revise the um, navigability and the, um, the rules on um, what kind of in size of boats that we need to allow passage through. So we've operated on the assumption that it'll continue to be a navigable waterway and that so we would have to build either a movable bridge or one that had that 55 foot clear Right, span. okay, all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was at that conversation as well, and I, I'm uh, definitely sympathetic with both uh, with the bicyclist and pedestrian point of view on this. I, I like cycling around the area. I don't like hill climbing uh, at all, um, and, I, and I, it, it is a barrier. So it's, it's one of the things I, I know we're paying attention to. We're definitely paying attention. Our preference would be as low profile a bridge as possible for a lot of reasons. That's, that's definitely one of the critical ones, but also the... The, the cost and the and the uh, scale of the magnitude of the bridge uh, is, far, is would be much bigger than we, than we're hoping. Uh, we've just got to figure out this this navigate. We, we need the bridge, so we've got to figure out the navigation issue, and then the relative cost of movable versus not movable. At uh, the conversation about decertifying is one we can now more more clearly have with our single congresswoman who represents both sides, who will be representing both sides of the river. But it will be, and, and I, I don't. We can't take it off the table. We'll take an act of Congress. That doesn't mean it's impossible. But it, decertifying even the uh, barge canal in order for us to build the Jefferson Bridge, when nothing was going through there at all, and you couldn't physically get through, 
was still um, a, a really big effort. And so, so we, we can't count on that decertification occurring, but we also, we, it's, a, it's, an, it's an effort we, we ought to, we ought to uh, make sure that we are opening up appropriately with, uh, with the Congresswoman Matsui and Congressman Thompson as well. So. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, this one is for information only. We've, we haven't been asked to adopt the neighborhood friendly guidelines directly. These, are, these were crafted um, very um, savvily by the, by the staff of both, both jurisdictions to, to meet the needs that were described here and also at the Sacramento City Council. But we hadn't asked at, the, at this council that they come back for our approval, but, but, uh, so, but we haven't heard any concerns or objections to them. So uh, let's, let's proceed and get the work done. So. All right, thank you very much. Thanks to the City of Sacramento uh, staff and stakeholders who are here as well. We really appreciate the, the um, dedication to, the, to getting this project done. There have been a lot of uh, obstacles and misdirections and what have you, and, and uh, we're, we're, on, we're on track, so let's, let's make it happen. Thanks so much. All right, uh, that brings us then to item, uh, item uh, 10, which is consideration of resolution 11-73 approving the sale of pension obligation bonds to refinance outstanding side fund obligations of the California Public Employees Retirement System. Ms. Bloomberg. <clears throat> We're in a, a favorable interest rate environment, and so, you know, staff's going to be coming to you, hopefully, with, with more of these potential refinancings, but this one's a unique one. Um, you know, usually we're, we're looking at outstanding bond issues related to um, CFDs or things like that. Uh, this one involves our CalPERS unfunded liability. And it's, it's kind of an interesting one because um, back in, in uh, 2003, when the fund was established uh, for the city's um, uh, fire and police uh, public safety funds, um, we had, you know, less than 100 active participants that participated in those risk pools. So we qualified uh, for that, for that uh, fund. And uh, at that time, um, CalPERS set this up to uh, allow uh, smaller agencies to pay off these unfunded liabilities over time with a, with a fixed term and, and fixed interest rate. And so uh, CalPERS charges us an interest rate of, of seven and three quarters on, on uh, those side fund payments. And right now, that outstanding liability for both those funds is uh, about $10.9 million. And so um, the savings, um, if, if, if we're successful, could save us in this interest rate environment about 300 basis points, or equated into a dollar number, about a, a million dollars uh, net present value over the, the next uh, 10 years. Uh, and it's also going to result in lowering our, our CalPERS Cal rates for police and fire once we refinance that. So, so the action to, to uh, pursue that opportunity is we're requesting that you approve the resolution uh, 1173. It will allow us to uh, move forward with the uh, issuance of pension obligation bonds. Um, these would basically pay off that CalPERS side fund, and then we'd be making uh, debt payments on, that, uh, pension, on the pension obligation bonds at a much lower interest rate. Um, and. Um, so uh, what we're asking is that you approve the, the bond documents necessary for us to issue the, uh, the bonds. Um, the bonds would be sold to a private, uh, as a private placement to an investor, in this case, Umqua Bank. The banks are, uh, find this, this type of investment attractive, and so Umqua is talking uh, to our finance team. And uh, so the other action uh, tonight would allow us to complete our negotiations uh, with Umqua. Um, one. So there, there's some details that we're still trying to, to work out with them and we'd be negotiating on, but your action would give us the parameters in which to negotiate. Um, we're uh, requesting uh, authorization to conduct a judicial validation proceeding to ensure that uh, the, the, uh, the courts recognize the validity of the outstanding uh, CalPERS obligation and hence the bonds that we issue uh, would, would be validated. Um, so that will be an action that, that actually works to be kind of a critical path for us. It's, it's the thing that delays us from closing on this, and it's, it's really the one risk in this deal, the, the risk that um, with the validation taking 60 to 90 days, the risk that interest rates will go up in that time frame. So we are talking to, our finance team is talking to Umqua about um, the ability to lock a rate as soon as possible, and so we, we want to, to lock rates mitigate that risk. Um, and so our, our goal is really to, to close this financing um, 
by February, uh, again, a, upon a successful completion of the validation action. And so I, ju I just wanted to recognize um, Nikki Talman from Brandis Tallman, uh, Andy Hall from Jones Hall, who are here, and Ken Deeker of Del Rio Associates. They're our finance team that are gonna help us get this done in time. All right, are questions for staff? Mr. Ledesma. Thank you, just a couple of quick questions. Thanks for um, articulating the um, uh, the this um, refinance deal for us. Just to, on the, in the staff report, you you lay out that if interest rates were to rise, which is why you're looking at a, at a lock. Um, is there if you can't get a lock? I mean, I think part of the thing is just to make sure there's are there costs we're incurring by going through this, these other actions? Are we are we, in, are we expending money to kind of get to a point where we can then lock a rate? Because it sounds like there's other actions going on. The, the judicial, judicial review and, and everything else. Right. Well, the only uh, you know all all the, the the costs are contingent except one. So our consultants will only uh, be paid fees if it if it closes. Okay. But the the contingent fee is the seventy five hundred dollars for the validation action. So if interest rates go up, we don't close. That's the the cost that's at risk seventy five hundred dollars. Okay. Thank you. It sounds um, like a reasonable transaction. So uh, this is the one on, with the, where you've got a specific recommendation. You're asking for our authority, our authorization to actually issue the bonds, but you're not telling us where the term is. We're we're capping that amount. So we're capping the interest rate at potentially five and three quarters. So if interest rates continue up at five and three quarters, we'd have at least 200 basis point savings. Uh, and then on the dollar amount, we're looking at, you know, we always go a little bit over. So uh, instead of 10.9 million, which is the outstanding principle, we put in the resolution 11.5 million. And that would, that would allow us flexibility, basically, if we're negotiating with UMQA and there's uh, an opportunity. But the, ter the term, the payoff term, oh, payoff which term, you've yes. described in the, if, if I were reading this quickly, I would think is fixed, but then there's a line in here that you're evaluating a longer term, but you're asking us for the authority to issue the bonds tonight? Yeah. So, the, so uh, that we're, the term of the bonds would not be a council choice? Well, the, 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 we're asking for the option to look at one or two years, and, and the, reason, the reason being is, is that that may uh, result in us realizing additional savings or, or structuring the deal in a way. One, one of the things we're looking at is an amortization uh, rate that will allow us to realize uh, more savings up front in the first few years. And so um, the, f the, the flex on the term is one to two years at the most. And again, that would just allow us to uh, pursue certain options such as realizing more upfront savings. I, I'm not for that, so I, 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 I just I, I want to draw it out because it's not clear. The way the staff report is constructed does not make that clear, right? If, if you just look at the terms, it says the term will be will stay as existing. You have to read the, the narrative to to realize that that you, that you are authorizing this. Given the unfunded liability we have on, retire, on retiree health and the unfunded liabilities of the system and the fact that we are planning for the new normal, mm -hmm. I, in my view, we need to we need to be. Um, you know, we need to get big getting on this. Um, and the retiree health, we're doing, you know, we've had to defer what we would wanted to buy down. We can't keep pushing these obligations uh, farther out. And I don't, you know, we could extend the term for more than two years and probably you could, I'm sure you could get us even better savings. Um, but we, I mean, my, at least my, my personal policy preference is that we, we take responsibility for these and, and, uh, and, and we start paying them off. We, uh, we've got these other ones that we have had to defer Lately, but this one we were making, we were already on a on a on a on a plan to pay it off within this time frame. So I'm I'm personally concerned about that, but also the just the sort of the governance question of not making that determination and owning it here at the council. Um, if the council makes that determination tonight, it will not, you know, uh, significantly impact our ability to pull off the refinancing and realize savings if we keep the term as is, which is. Uh, one, uh, one of them is nine years, the other is 10 years. Yeah. So um, keep, keeping, let's say, a uh, term of 10 years, if that's acceptable, um, we, we, we can do, or keep it the same, nine and 10 years. 
I might be, I might be alone. I just, I, I, you know, we've the, the the choice that we made to not yeah. fully continue the trajectory on retiree health was a tough one for us, and I know it was a tough one for me to to have to push that on to the next, the what hopefully will be the next generation of the council, and not not still uh, not, at least another two of us for another 15 years, um, and so I, I just I want to be responsible and and take ownership. Uh, to the extent that we already have at least, or at least not not give up the ownership that we've already taken over some of these challenges fiscally. So it would make it would be different if we thought that this was all going to turn around in five years, and if we just hold on, if we just grab on long enough, it will all take care of itself. But none of us believe that anymore, and so we need to we need to be disciplined about making the payments. So I I prefer the, to to maintain the term. I mean, if you're aligning the two of them together, I don't have a problem with that. I just don't want to I don't want to fall in the trap of of reducing our current obligations by continuing to pile on obligations into the, into the, into the future. So, uh, I, Paul, I guess one of the things is, is by extending the term, we have a savings of, we'll say, a million dollars. Is that, in a nutshell, really what really sort of happens? Um, actually, if it, uh, the base case we laid out in the staff report was where the term just stayed the same and we realized a million dollars net present value savings. Um, so really, um, the, the issue of extending a year or two, those were just options we were looking at in terms of flexibility if we start negotiating so why with would, the banks. I guess the question is, is why would you want to do that if there's not going to be any savings? There possibly could be savings, and, and either savings or acceleration of the um, return to us. and so. Part of it is wh how it matches the bank's interest uh, for their own portfolio. And if, if we can match their interests in term, we may be able to get a slightly better deal and have more net present value savings or have those savings up, up here earlier in, in the time frames. But it isn't critical, and we're not talking about massive amounts of money, but when you're talking about refinancing $10 million, you might, you might gain um, hundred thousand dollars if you did it in the right way and so that's what we're talking about it we're but not it talking about a period of time right if you ex if if for example we matched the two and had them both in in in, in ten years instead of one and nine years and the other in ten that might fit better the bank's portfolio and they might reward us with a slightly better structure in the bonds we don't know that absolutely the case. We have those requests out to them, and we don't have the information. The reason we seem like we're accelerating this a bit is because it takes a while to get the validation. We wanted to get that initiated as quickly as we could so that we didn't run the additional risk of having the interest rates change on us. And I think if the council wants to provide either the guidance that we don't go out any longer than 10 years or that we do it exactly the way it is. Either of those uh, directions can be accommodated. Well, I, I'm personally fine with the 10 year alignment, the alignment so that in case you need to issue these as a single bond, that makes, that makes perfectly good sense. I'm just not, I'm not, I'm just not for the you know, potential going to 13 years that's, that's, that's uh, envisioned in the staff report. I don't think so. Okay. We don't have any requests to speak on this, so there's no further discussion. Is there a motion on the item? So is the, is the I just want to um, understand, so we are, um, our, our direction based on your recommendation is not to go out or pursue anything longer. I just want to understand. Longer than 10 years. Long, we, we, we would prefer to match what the current debt obligation is, the maturity of these are. Correct. Right, right now it's nine and, nine and nine ten. And ten. Nine and ten. Right. I mean, I think ten's fine, but you're, you can. No, I know, I know. I'm, 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 I'm asking the question. Yeah. Is there, is, because I, th I think the action tonight is, is, is meant to kind of get started on this other exercise of validation. And um, I, I would personally be interested if, if I understand the issue and I, I don't have a preference to extend it out longer, but if it provides us some savings going out a year or two longer. I'd like to know that. And so I'm not sure if there's an opportunity to come check back with us to find out what the final terms are. Because we don't have that information. We won't know that until February? 
That's fine. Is that right? We um, will likely be able to check it, check back in before Feb, well before February. Uh, in fact, maybe within um, four to six weeks with the, where we're at in terms of okay. negotiations with the bank. But if we approve the tenure, if we approve the tenure number tonight, there's nothing preventing you to come, from coming back in that time frame and saying, hey, uh, you know, we, we, we found we could get another $90,000 out of this if we went for another year. That's correct. And we could do that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Are we you open a public hearing? Or? There's no public hearing on this. So. Okay, so uh, I will move the recommended action. The ten years or with the, at the ten, at the ten years, yeah, okay. and then yeah, that's fine with me as long as we do come back um, or there's an opportunity to come back. I'm fine with that. So moved. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> All right, the motion carries. Um, thanks to staff for, for both, actually for both of these items. I mean, there's, this, is, this is one piece of a lot of efforts that are underway by our very capable and creative staff looking for every possible way to, um, to, to, make, uh, to generate revenue, to make savings, uh, to minimize the need for uh, other reductions in the city's operations and services that we provide. So this is a, this is a good, these were good proposals and we appreciate them as a council, thanks. All right, by prior order, we've uh, continued item 11 to the November meeting. So item 12 is consideration of an assignment agreement and a purchase and sale agreement between the city of West Sacramento and the Ramos Group for the city's interest in real property of a, a 1.48 acre site located at the intersection of Tower Bridge Gateway at 3rd Street and South River Road. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, as you said before, before you tonight are two real estate contracts with the city of West Sacramento and the Ramos Group, which would complete the block that is at the corner of Tower Bridge Gateway and South River Road, which once it's open, we'll be referring to it as Riverfront Street. Um, it completes the entire block. It would be owned by the Ramos Group right now. Approximately about half of the developable area is owned either by the city in fee or the city has an option on it with uh, the redevelopment agency owned property that's at the corner and these two real estate contracts would bring all that property under uh, one developer and allow that site to be developed in a consolidated manner. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, detailed information about both contracts has been included in the staff report. All right, are there questions or comments by members of the council? The item's been uh, vetted extensively in that closed session as well. <laughs> we've talked about this item quite a bit, and I, and I think we've come to a uh, equitable, and I think both sides have won, and when that happens, I think it's, it's, that's the direction we really like to go. All right, so it's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Christoph. I would, I'll, I'll uh, if ready for a motion, I would, off, I would uh, recommend um, the recommended action of once, two, and three. Okay, it's been seconded by Mr. Johannesson. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries. Item 14 is presentation and first reading of Ordinance 11-13, amending Chapter 8.12 of the Municipal Code relating to fireworks. Yes, um, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. As you will recall, um, on August 3rd of this year, Council received a follow-up report concerning the 2011 fireworks season. At that time, staff identified the need for a minor amendment to the fireworks chapter of the Municipal Code. Currently, the uh, code reads that an organization applying for a seller's permit is required to have a minimum of 20 members. This requirement does not, however, address organizations that are governed by small boards and but may have a large volunteer base. So the proposed language simply clarifies that these latter organizations would also be eligible provided that they attest to the fact that they would have enough volunteers to staff the uh, fireworks booth. So staff is just respectfully recommending that you conduct the first reading of an ordinance and we come back for an adoption at the next meeting. All right. And um, since he was the particular um, uh, instigator of the original ordinances, do you know if Mr. Viegas has been has he been briefed on this item and provide any feedback? Um, I didn't specifically talk with him, but this is exactly what was presented at August 3rd. Um, 
it, okay. th there hasn't been any changes since that time. So just grammar wise, if I can understand, so the, this, this second option, um, I mean, under the current ordinance, the membership, it's not just that you have 20 members, but you have 20 members um, that are West Sacramentans, either by residents or by their, by their um, business um, ownership. The 20 volunteers language doesn't have any of those modifiers on it, so are, are we saying that any organization would be eligible just if it has any 20 volunteers from anywhere? Or? No, for, for example, the, the, the organization that specifically came to mind was the West Sacramento Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's governed by a small board, but they have lots of volunteers. Those volunteers may or may not be West Sacramento residents, but they would have a West Sacramento affiliation in, the, in that they would be volunteering for that particular organization. So it would still have to be a West Sacramento-based board. So is that somewhere else in the code that's not referenced in this section? Because this, this sec it looks like this section is the section that says the organization has to have members that are in West Sac, either by residence or employment. But th we, don't, we don't repeat or reference that same clarifier when it comes to the 20 volunteers. And I, we, I don't have the whole ordinance in front of me, just oh. the language that we're amending. But no, I, see no, what you're I, I think you're right. I right. think we can work with the language a little bit. Uh, the intention was clearly to say not to remove the local angle from it but to say either you have 20 members or you can come up with 20 volunteers. So if the council's comfortable moving it forward, we can, we can come back even for second reading with language that will more clearly state that. I know, I'm, I'm, I, I know that'd be important. I mean, that, that, I mean, we had such demand from organizations to participate and it was a big success and more, even more will, will in the next round. And we really want, we re I mean, we designed this program uh, to support local West Sacramento Nonprofit organizations, and I know that that you know that staff's intent too. But so okay. we need we need to draw that that language carefully to make sure that it's it's not easily manipulated by out of town organizations. Sure, we can so, do that. We can okay. tighten that part up. Okay. Other question? Other discussion? Mr. Ledesma? No. Okay. We're ready for a motion. A motion? Sure. I'll move uh, the recommended action with yeah. the. Proposed amendment on the or, on defining and qualifying the organization. Okay. Second. And seconded by Mr. Johannesson. Seeing no further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries. Item 15 is consideration of a new program model for preschool and child care center at the community center, and approval of classification description and salary and benefit schedule for preschool site supervisor. Mr. Richardson. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. <coughs> tonight we're asking you to take. Um, some action concerning the uh, preschool and child care center that um, will soon to be operating at the community center. When this, uh, uh, the, mo the concept of having a preschool and child care center at the community, <coughs> uh, community center was first um, envisioned, we had always planned to have a uh, private or nonprofit operator um, run the center. And, and toward that end, we, you know, we, we just had selected the YMCA of, Nor of Superior California to run the center. And um, the, the opening of the center has been delayed primarily for a lot of um, internal reasons uh, with the YMCA. They just, they don't have a lot of staff and administrative capabilities to, um, to develop and operate a center. And we had become increasingly concerned that, that this would be an ongoing problem with them. In the meantime, with this delay, it had allowed us to reevaluate whether this was still the best program model for the operation of the center. We, can, we came to the conclusion that we at the staff level could probably operate this like, like a program that we operate in the recreation department or our discovery preschool center. So what we're asking you tonight to do is to um, approve a different program model that would allow um, city staff to operate the center with the same quality standards that we have for our Up for West Sac program and our infant and toddler uh, program and that we, you take the first action toward that end by um, approving the position of preschool site supervisor, which would be the day-to-day -day, um, supervisor for, th for the center. If you do this, what, we would, be, what we, would, we would be embarking upon is having the license for the center cr transferred to the city. It's currently, um, this, this week it was actually issued to YMCA. And this, we would go through the transfer process to have it transferred back to the city, and then we would embark upon hiring the site supervisor 
and then the, the teachers that would go with it. Our uh, pro forma or our evaluation of revenues and expenses show that we could actually operate the center um, at a lower cost than the YMCA could. And one of the problems we were having with the YMCA was allowing them to pay us some rent or contribute toward the operation of the facility. They didn't have the capabilities to pay a lot towards, towards the operation of the center. We believe with uh, us operating the center, we can actually maintain a competitive childcare rate, um, have a program for lower income families that could participate in the center and still contribute to the operating costs of the center at, to a greater degree than we would have had the YMCA or another nonprofit operate, operate it. So again, um, in, the, in the staff report, we outline what our revenue estimates and our expense estimates would be for the next three years. In year one, we do um, project a small, a small deficit just because we are very conservatively um, uh, projecting how children will enroll in the center. If you look at the attachment that's in the back of your report, um, we wanted to be very conservative as to how many children we thought at what level um, would be enrolling in the center. We actually think we're gonna be a little more um, there's gonna be a higher demand than, than projected here, but we wanted to be very conservative um, in our estimates. Um, we're fairly conf very confident that we could operate the center at no cost to the general fund, that it could be fully um, self-sufficient, and that we could still do it at the, the high quality standards that we've set for our other programs. The other advantage to us operating the center versus the YMCA or some other provider is that there are some new um, programs being offered by First 5 California, and we think that it would be easier for us to merge in with First 5 YOLO and uh, use some of the, um, the funds from First 5 California that might be available into our program model. So um, this is a, de a departure from what we'd already planned. We're pretty excited about the opportunity to do so, and we're asking for your support. Mr. Johanneson. Yeah, Carol, just on the um, revenue projection, so how do you, um, where do you see the growth is between the three years of revenue? Um, where city's not gonna be growing then, so where are all the kids coming the, the from? The growth in revenue is, um, is by having more children. If, if you look, we, we start with um, you know, going from 12 to 28 children over the course of, um, over the course of the first year. And so we would think there'd be more, um, more children after that, and then we could also probably increase the increase the rates. The rates that are in the um, the revenue estimate here are um, very competitive. They're um, actually probably lower than the average rate being charged right now. So again, also these revenue estimates do not include any um, funding that we already have approved for. Um, CDBG, any contributions that we might have from First Five California or First Five YOLO, we specifically left those those out of these projections because they are trans, you know, transitory in nature, and some of them are speculative. So we we wanted to be extremely conservative in our revenue projections, uh, so we wouldn't um, overstate um, what we could possibly achieve. So so the um, the increase in kids um, is because more people become aware of the service. Yes, and a lot of a lot of times we have um, we'll be start opening the program in January or February, which is not usually a traditional month to open a new center. You, you typically would want to do that at the beginning of a school year. Um, you don't have to, but that's typically when you you would target. So we would we would probably want to ramp up a little slowly anyway, just to make sure that um, the program is operating smoothly, and then gradually increase it as the year goes on. Yeah, I, I just, um, you know, because there is a potential that if it doesn't meet these protection uh, projections, it'll be a general fund hit. Um, um, you know, I'd be concerned to make sure that there's advertising um, to make sure these these projections do um, materialize in terms of the kids enrolling. A absolutely. People know We're about it and maybe above and beyond what we normally would do because the city is pretty much gonna, going to be on the hook for this. Or at some point have to decide it can't do it anymore and, and try to find a private operator. That absolutely, we're, we're very committed to having this operate like a business or like our, our enterprise funds. Basically, the revenue we, b we bring in is the revenue we use to operate the program. Thank you. 
Mayor Pro Tem Christoph. Uh, Carol, um, so in other words, these new employees then become the employees of West Sacramento? That's correct. We'd have a site supervisor who'd be a regular um, employee for the city, and then the, um, the teachers would be, our, would be what we call tier two extra help um, teachers, the same um, level of classification that we use to operate the uh, Discovery Preschool. So if I do the math correctly, you're gonna have to generate about $4,000 per student in order, the parent's gonna have to make a $4,000 uh, payment to the uh, child care center for watching the kids and doing well, it, it preschool? Depends, it depends on what program that you're in. If you're um, in the full day program without a discount, the rates we have in the staff report are about $600 a month. If you're in the, um, the part day program, they'd be about $323 a month. And they're, and that's also for the affordable rate. No, the affordable rate is is lower than that. It's some um, three hundred and one hundred and sixty one. The affordable rate uh, for at least the first two years would be offset by um, CDBG funding that we're going to be receiving, but which again is not calculated into the revenue estimates. Because I noticed that you there are some for supplies and equipment and things. There's something that is. Uh, child care impact fee, and that was the source of revenue for that. Well, we yeah, the child the child care impact fee fund was used uh, in part to build the structure, right, and uh, and and to equip the structure, the the capital that went into equipping the structure. The so the it's really not an O and M. It's not an O and M expense. The O and M expense is built into the expenses. It's the the child care impact fee money was used for the capital outlay that built it and equipped it. Okay. Well, I, I, quite frankly, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and support this, but I have some real reservations. And, you know, I mean, the city has gone through two to three rounds of layoffs and other things. And it, this, I, I don't know, it, it's, uh, um, I mean, I realize that this comes from a whole different funding source and everything else, but... You know, we've all lost a lot of friends that uh, uh, have gone on to do other things or and, and sort of been forced to. And uh, I just want to make sure that we're on very, very conservative ground so that um, something like this doesn't tie or come back into some of the, the general fund kind of uh, issues that we may have in in the future because everything's not done yet. We're we're not out of the woods, and just want to make sure that there's enough revenue being generated so that we can put a program like this together. And um, you know, these are are good things. But those employees that are gone now did some good things too. So uh, we sh we share um, your concern, and we actually think that this model actually provides for more um, support towards the operation of the center, the, the overall community center, yeah. than the uh, previous proposal would have done, which thereby allows for more support to the general fund than we would have had before. So we okay. think it's it's not only beneficial to our, our child, care pro child care and preschool program, but also beneficial to the city overall. Uh, Mr. Ledesma? Thank you. I just, you know, I, I think some of the questions that I would have asked or have been asked already, so I won't repeat the questions, but I, 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 I do share some concern um, with the venture not having kind of gone through the exercise of looking at the original model. Was Is there a, the, the previous model, which is, um, Looking at an outside group coming in, and they understand what the prohibit uh, what prohibited that is. It was is there other options that we pursued in lieu of that group? Once we it sounded like we, we kind of got through working with them, and it just wasn't going to pencil. And we discovered that if we if we expand one or two people and bring somebody in, that we can do it ourselves. Is there another option? Because again, I'm trying to look at it from a 
financial point of view that it's that is we're, we're adding people with it with possible revenue coming in from outside sources um, to support well, the, we, we, the did an R, we did an RFP for the original um, provider we didn't have a an overwhelming response a lot of what we were told was one of the reasons was because the center isn't that isn't that big it's it's going to be licensed for 48 for 48 children and that makes it difficult for a, a provider to um, to make money on on that level that so we didn't get we didn't get a lot of uh, responses um, the YMCA felt pretty confident that they would be able to um, to their nonprofits so they would be able, they'd be able to operate and also pay us so, something to contribute toward the operate the operating costs of the community center as we got into negotiating with them, it, and they were working their, with their numbers a little more closely, the amount that they were going to be able to contribute towards rent or utilities or maintenance of the facility was rather paltry. And, and it was becoming increasingly difficult. We, we were providing more and more in the way of support to them. And then they didn't have enough administrative support to really bring the program to fruition here. And so that, that was what was causing the delay. They'd hi they hired two directors. They didn't want to pay the person while the, pro while the facility was being licensed, so the two directors left, and they kept delaying the opening of it. And that's what caused us to kind of go back and reevaluate the, the program model and decided that, you know, this is probably something we could do ourselves. One of the, th the, the contributing factors that led to that decision was um, early Learning Services took over uh, the operation of the Discovery Preschool at Sam Combs Park. And during um, that time, we actually doubled. We have, we have two sessions running there that are almost at capacity. And we, we, we gained some confidence in our ability to do that and to operate, you know, you know have revenues meet expenses. So um, that kind of buoyed our, our, uh, our look, re-look at this. So, I mean, we're very committed to making this operate in a, in a sound fashion for the city. We, we want to be self-sufficient and independent. We don't want to be a drain on the general fund. We've had a lot of interest in the um, facility. We already have people calling and we have, we've established a waiting list. So we think that it's going to be um, a center that uh, is um, very attractive to a lot of families in, in West Sacramento. The other concept that's um, articulate a little bit in the report is we wanted this center to be available to families of a variety of income levels. We didn't want it to be just a center that only um, families who, um, who had higher incomes could, could attend. Uh, it was becoming increasingly difficult with the YMCA, even though they have a scholarship program, to make that, make that work with them. Um, we think with us doing it and um, the CDBG money that we're going to have and some of the other programs uh, money that is going to possibly become available from First Five California, we'll be able to, to integrate that into our program model a little more effectively than the Y or somebody else could have. And, and, I, and, I, and that's the part that, that um, I, I understand that part, that we're, we're, we're going to be able to leverage those other programs and bring in the support to the, the center. And... Um, and I think it's just a matter of um, getting, I, I'm looking at the projections and, and the detailed projections, and they are conservative. I, 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 again, just knowing that there's not a whole lot of daycare facility or um, in, in West, I don't think that's changed too much in the last three to five years since my kids have grown out of that stage. Um, that I'm sure that there will be demand, but it's just an imperative that we have the management and the, you know, just the management and the oversight to make sure that we're meeting those projections both on the revenue side and the expense side. Um, because Absolutely. I think we there, we can't, once we let the horse out of the barn, you know, we're, we're you know, as Mr. Kristoff pointed out, we have, now we're bringing on more people um, that will have to ma um, be a part of the overall city's budget. And then, um, you know, the program, I support the program on what you're, what we're trying to achieve here. Well, hardly, and I, you know, we'll open up the facility, and and then, you know, something else changes in two years. We're not meeting our projections, then they lose a resource, and I just we would we would be hard pressed to fill that. So those those are just my concerns. I'm not sure where they lead. I'm supportive of 
um, supportive of this and moving forward because I think it does um, um, fulfill a great need. I just want to make sure that we're, we're doing all we can to manage it from both the top side and the expense side. Well, I'm, I'm supportive of actually for all the reasons that have been, for all the concerns that have been raised. I mean, we made the commitment when we started, the, when we launched this effort that uh, we wouldn't be encroaching on the general fund and I, I'm, I still stand by that. It, this is a critical program, both for the benefits that the uh, preschool model has been showing, but also it is still the case that, you know, when, when City Tuttle um, all those years ago first brought this issue forward and Carolyn um, uh, you know, raised it back up again, that we have uh, wholly inadequate um, options for, for parents with, um, with kids, these eight, with toddlers who, who need these, um, these services. Um, and so it, it's definitely needed. At the same time, uh, if we're moving this to an enterprise model, maybe we ought to be doing that more formally. I mean, maybe there ought to be an early learning um, in child care fund in the city, just like there's a water fund and a sewer fund, and we treat it as an actual enterprise as opposed to as if it were an enterprise. And uh, um, you know, just as we do with those other with those other functions, so that it doesn't audit, doesn't encroach on the general fund directly, and uh, the expectations around because I think it's true, it is true from we, with the lesson we've le learned from discovery, and I, I'm confident we will see in the center across the street is that there's significant demand. If anything, we're going to be it's uh, 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 and, and thank God for that because if there wasn't, um, I'd be concerned about competing with the private sector providers, but that's not an issue because we have, there's so few private sector providers for so much need in the community um, that can be served here. But there is enough demand, there is enough demand to make this self-support, not only self-supporting, but to support, in, in this case, some contribution to the operation of the, of the community center. And potentially, you know, done right and, and at the right scale here in a discovery, and there may be other opportunities, that the whole early learning services function um, in addition to the grants that we're able to achieve and whatever the first five California strategy ends up being could be partly supported by this as well. So I, I think moving in the direction of treating um, preschool and early learning services as, as formally as an enterprise in the city is, uh, that is, is, worth, is worth exploring and that this is, the, this is a key step in order to make that, make that happen. Well, personally, I probably would have some reservation with that because, I mean, I think that one of the things government really can't do, and that is, is to really infringe on the private sector. You know, it, it's pretty easy for the government to crack the, the nut, so to speak, that needs to be cracked uh, when you can apply for CBDG and you can do some other kinds of things. And the private sector really doesn't have that opportunity. But it's the private sector that's going to generate the jobs, create the jobs, and do the things and, and, and get this economy going again. And, I would just be a little reluctant. I mean, I realize that education is, is it's a different can of worms, so to speak, but at the same time, <clears throat> if the profit levels were high enough, you can bet that private sector would be really involved in that particular kind of business. They're just not high enough. And so, but, uh, 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 I mean, like I say, I'm gonna support this, but. I don't know how much further we can really sort of carry this kind of thing because um, I, I just think that private sector really needs to step in and, and do some of these things also. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I just I feel like the analysis, the research that we got uh, when when both Cindy and Carolyn were here hasn't changed in terms of the structure of the supply market for child care. And it's not, it's not unique to West Sacramento, but the structure of the, of the workforce requirements, the certification requirements, the permitting requirements, the cost of operating a child care business, and especially of operating, you know, a quality preschool um, are quite, ex they're, you know, they're, they're enormous and they're, it's very difficult and particularly in an economic climate like this, you just can't charge enough. You can't, the parents can't afford to pay the kind of cost that you need to do that on a consistent basis, which is why we haven't, despite Severe demand in this community for for childcare and for preschool. We that would not we we if if anything we've lost ground since we started on, on, in this work. So I agree. I don't. I certainly don't think we should be in a position of trying to serve most of the market. Um, and but which so I'm not really worried about 48 you know slots causing that. And I, and I know you aren't either. But so I just it feels like there's there's a niche for us to play 
while also being attentive to the, you know, the, the issues like we were facing with the rec center and others. That we, you know, we're not trying to, we don't want to put any private folks out of business, and we don't want to diminish the economic opportunities for the private sector. But it's also at some point we have to respond to the, the basic mar market failure that's not causing private providers to come forward because the economics aren't working for them. So I, I think this is a good step forward, and it, it's at a scale that allows us to keep this, you know, to keep our eyes on both on both sides of the equation as we go forward. Mr. Johansson. Yeah, just maybe to comment on the economics of this. I know um, in my line of business, I see cases all day long where where people um, who can work can't work because the cost of childcare is more expensive than than uh, they could earn. So we do have to have a solution in this city that allows people to. Um, to um, work and, and child care that's reasonable within their budget, and I'm not sure the private sector is going to be able to do that because it's just it's at the at the lower end of you know three or four hundred bucks a month is, is cheap in terms of child care. It's dirt cheap. I mean, it is really cheap. It's, it's dirt cheap, and you and, know it's you know, really interesting because I'm sorry. Go on. No, Go no. On. I mean, a, a minimum wage person is is uh, you know fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred dollars a month. You know, probably no taxes, so they're a third of the income already goes to child care, even at this level. So it is necessary, even though, um, you know, jobs, we're trying to build jobs, and um, so you want to have the, have the ability of people to get jobs to begin with. If I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, you, you, you bring up an interesting point on how we treat um, this enterprise going forward. If, we, if, if it's truly going to be that, then I, I, I'm supportive that we should probably move towards it being more towards from, a, from an accounting and budgetary standpoint being an enterprise fund. Um, because I think that would further the accountability we'll need to make sure it's doing two things. One, it's truly furthering the mission that we're, we're, we're lining out for. We don't want it to scope creep and it to, to end up being serving people which we didn't intend. Um, and, and to make sure that we do keep it and we can support it from a financial point of view so that we know we see all the expenses coming in. So I support it from, from that endeavor. I don't think, you know, I, we, we just talked about this, but I, 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 that market isn't being met now, and, and there is a role for us to, and the government to step in and supply that if necessary because, it's, um, because it is necessary. It's an important thing we've said that, but um, I think that it, when we're establishing any sort of enterprise fund and having not been one, it does require us to have some scrutiny, some, it's a big step for our, our city and in, in, in any time, especially in this time. Um, and the economy. So um, I just ask for that sort of formality that we kind of approach it that way. It's just not a project we're taking on. We are taking on actually an enterprise. Any other discussions or motion on item 15? Mr. Johannesson. <laughs> um, I recommend the, um, or uh, make the motion to approve the new program model under the, the operation of the Child Care and Preschool Center at the Community Center and approve the classification description and salary and benefit schedule for the position of preschool site supervisor for the center. I'll second. All right, it's been, it's been seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Right. Council calendar, Thank Ms. You. Richardson. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to point out what's not on the calendar is on October 22nd, on Saturday, uh, here at City Hall, there's going to be a uh, flu shot clinic that the uh, Yellow County um, Department of Health is going to be conducting. It's from 8 to 5, and it's free for all um, residents of Yolo County and, um, for, c and for city employees um, also, if, even if you don't reside in Yolo County. So that would will be here from 8 to 5 on the 22nd. Right, any questions on the calendar? City manager report. Yes, thank you. This evening I have a few items to talk about, and I, I'd start with the discussion that uh, Mayor Kambalden had earlier about the significant um, change that the POA contract represents in terms of re-evaluating re and modifying the benefit packages. Um, I want to take that in, in a slightly different direction. I want to uh, really thank the um, participants in that process for a very collaborative effort to get to a decision and get to an agreement that occurred in a relatively expeditious manner, uh, well in advance of any termination of the contract, and without a lot of um, 
additional fireworks or other kinds of concerns. So I think it, we're hoping that this is the sort of model that we could expect for uh, future labor negotiations. Um, I also wanted to remind the council that I sent you a memo about the Business Resource um, Center and they're looking for any responses or comments you might have by tomorrow. And if there are any, you can direct them through um, Linda Vargas in, in my office. Then um, earlier we discussed the um, WASAFCA, the JPA, Flood Protection JPA, um, and what we maybe hadn't emphasized is that this has be gone from being a uh, technical meeting where nobody has much interest in the outcome, um, and certainly not much personal interest, to one where there are some property owners who are very much concerned. And on that basis, the, um, the meetings are going to be shifted to City Hall so that there's really um, an opportunity for people to feel more comfortable than they were in, the, in a small space that didn't really accommodate much in the way of public access and public attendance. So that will, going forward, at least for the time being, as we still have a lot of public interest in the deliberations of that board, um, we'll be moving it to the city, uh, city council chambers. Same time, different place. And then finally, I wanted to alert the council that I am planning to take a week off next week, and I will be out of town, and Carol will be here in my stead. All right, any questions for the city manager? City Attorney report. All right, then we have no future agenda item requests. Staff direction from members of the council. None, so motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. By Mayor Pro Tem Christoph, seconded by Mr. Ledesma. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, hearing none. Motion carries, meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.